I am very fortunate and privileged to uh, live and work on Wurundjeri country, so I'd just like to start by acknowledging that and paying my respects to Wurundjeri elders past, present and emerging. I'd particularly like to thank Uncle Dave for the uh, inspiring and I'll have to say, intimidatingly eloquent. Um, <laughs> welcome to country. Thanks so much, uh, Dave. That was uh, amazing. Um, I'd also like to thank the Society uh, for inviting me in as a member, um, as a fellow, I should say. Thanks, Rob and, um, and Mike, for that privilege, and also uh, for the privilege of being at this incredibly uh, crucial forum today. This is um, right at the uh, at the very heart of my uh, of my work and, and in a way my my meaning of life and so um, thank you for hosting such an important forum. Also, I want to thank um, Rob and uh, Mike and Anth for relieving me of the uh, duty of just saying how terrible biodiversity crisis is and the extinction crisis. Um, all of my natural instincts are uh, asking me to just go back and reflect on, you know, the loss of of, uh, of 100 species since European invasion, the, the 1,800 species on our list, but I'm just not going to. Thank you so much for uh, for that introduction about the problem. I'm, uh, I'm asked to talk about opportunities, low-hanging fruit, uh, and so I'm going to start with uh, some of the fruit that's lowest hanging. No surprises to anybody in the room that Whilst climate change is, you know, probably thought of in the public uh, and certainly in the, uh, amongst politicians now, uh, thanks to uh, Saturday week ago, uh, as the existential crisis of our time, uh, it's it's all it's it's probably only just ahead or maybe just behind uh, the biodiversity crisis, the extinction crisis, in my mind, as the key uh, existential threat. Uh, it's also an opportunity. For biodiversity and, and I'm sure many of you already work in the space uh, of leveraging climate uh, mitigation and climate adaptation opportunities towards the benefit of biodiversity and the obvious thing is biodiverse restoration uh, in order to sequester carbon to offset uh, the emissions of uh, large carbon emitting industries. Uh, this is something we actually, it's, it sounds so easy it's of course not that easy. Reconstructing ecosystems is incredibly difficult, uh, but you can gain some biodiversity benefit through just establishing a canopy, by establishing a canopy in a mid-story, by using the species that are best adapted for this place, which is usually the species that uh, exist there already, but sometimes it's other species because the environment is changing. And there's some wonderful work by CSRO and Bush Heritage Australia um, out just west of Bendigo on the, the Nardu Hills Reserve, where they're actually adapting the provenances of the grey box and the yellow box to bring them from places that are hotter and drier, and they're actually seeing those provenances do better uh, in their Nardu Hills Reserve uh, than the, the provenances of the eucalypts that, that were there on site uh, already. So this kind of agility and adaptability represents uh, a huge opportunity, I think, we have to be careful with the carbon and biodiversity thing. The sort of, if you like, the, the, the add-on of biodiversity is, uh, can be a feel-good thing. We have to make sure that we actually measure the biodiversity benefits properly and well and robustly, and we've got to certify those measurements. So there's a whole bunch of measurement um, ideas and clarity, certification methods and other things we need to set up to make sure that this is actually done properly and that the benefits to biodiversity are tangible and transparent and available for everybody to see. We've got to get this right culturally as well. There's a whole, um, whole bunch of important reasons why uh, we need to um, be very careful about uh, involving and providing leadership and um, empowering uh, traditional owners to lead this where they where they want to uh, so that the things that we do in this country are actually respecting the country and are respecting the history of the country and the people who uh, managed it for 100,000 100, years uh, before we got here and started to wreck it all. So that leads me to, I think, what is my second most obvious low-hanging fruit uh, opportunity for the day. There's only four, so um, we'll move through them fairly quickly. I think two-way learning and supporting uh, traditional owners, empowering traditional owners in, in uh, cultural land management is a huge opportunity. Um, thanks, Damien, for already uh, raising the Ned's Corner story. I think that's a, a, a great new story for us to, to focus on uh, uh, and to recognise what's possible and what's sort of already being uh, 
thought about and done uh, in this room. I think that's that's a really great story. Um, I just wanted to to show this picture of um, Anya Stroblin and um, Gladys Bidu and Pamela Jeffrey up in Matu country. These are two uh, elders and rangers on Matu country who were working with Anya at the invitation of the Matu people to help them design uh, the monitoring programs to uh, see how Bilby are responding to uh, cultural fire and also to um, and predator control in that country. And this is an example of, uh, I won't go into the details, but where uh, the knowledge, the ways of knowing were coming together to help us do actually a better job uh, and engaging local people because we were, uh, we were working with the way they wanted to talk about country and record what was happening on country, not just the way the white fellow scientists who were coming in wanted to do it. So this is a great story, happy to expand on that later. And just to reiterate Damien's point, um, more than 44% now uh, of the national reserve system is actually IPA, um, but not more than 44% of the funding for the national reserve system goes to IPA. So some really basic things that we can do about redressing imbalance in terms of uh, the acknowledgement of the importance of, of uh, IPAs in, in, uh, in the <coughs> conservation estate in Australia. Um, and of course, you know, that over 42% of the country there is uh, native title uh, rights. So uh, a huge um, opportunity for us to learn and do better uh, in terms of land management on a huge part of the country. This is such a rich space, this engagement and bringing political will space. Um, it's sort of almost daunting to talk about. A Fern did a wonderful job of set, setting out some of the key aspects of it. Um, I just wanted to highlight a, a little project here that we had under the Threatened Species Hub about helping bring curriculum into primary schools in Victoria uh, that was teaching local st uh, students about the culturally significant species in their place. This was work actually led by Sarah Beckersey and Georgia Garrard at RMIT. Um, with, uh, were you inv involved in that project, Uncle Dave? I, I know that we th there was... Yeah, yeah, of course. So there was a, a, yeah, a lot of um, leadership there from from your mob uh, in in setting up the the program in that in the first case study school. It's a great opportunity. All of the kids have done pre and post uh, surveys after before and after this engagement process. They were all hugely enthused by the way that way of learning about science. They actually was they felt that the science was much more interesting when it was conveyed in a locally relevant and inspiring way uh, than when it was the way that they previously had that education. So a, a huge opportunity for engagement and building the, um, I guess, if you like, the political motivation, if I would be so grubby, of the next generation uh, of people who are actually going to go out and, um, and vote and purchase and consume in sustainable ways and, and try and do things that are, that are uh, biodiversity positive. Of course, there's a whole lot of other elements to political will. It's also about, um, about people uh, empowering or bottom-up uh, motivation for our parliaments and our leaders. Uh, and so I think we've got a huge opportunity now with the, the so-called green and teal wave that we've seen emerging uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we're in the process of trying to set up something called the Biodiversity Council, which is, a, which is an independent um, authoritative uh, think tank about biodiversity along the lines of the Climate Council to provide frank and fearless advice about um, current failures and what the opportunities are to do better for biodiversity. So there's something I'm happy to chat with anybody about later. And of course, um, great to see Graham here today. Uh, thanks so much for this fa fabulous uh, independent review of the, of the EPBC Act. I think this was a case where we definitely had 80-20. Uh, we, we were ready to go uh, and the government of the day just wasn't prepared to uh, go with the recommendations uh, from Graham's review. And so I think this is a huge opportunity now with the incoming government to actually see the implementation of the Samuels Review um, and the improvement of the effectiveness of the EPBC Act, which we all acknowledge is currently failing to protect um, biodiversity and, and our natural uh, heritage. Often I hear people talk about the resource problem. We've got a resource problem. I'm actually just um, 
I, I, I'm starting to realise that actually this talk about resource, yes, we are underfunded in terms of biodiversity conservation, in terms of land management, and indeed in the, the recent Victorian Auditor General Office report uh, that they indicated that funding available to protect threatened species falls significantly uh, short of what's needed. Our current spend nationally uh, targeted towards threatened species is only around $120 million a year. That's an average across a number of years. Um, overall environmental spending largely through the National Land Care Program uh, drops out at about $250 million a year. And we've worked out that um, in order to actually save all of the threatened species on our list, we could do that with around $1.6 billion a year. Um, and that this is this, these are much more rubbery figures about nationally what we would need to uh, invest to actually improve environmental outcomes and this may sound like quite a lot of money, 1.6 or 2.3 uh, 2 to $3 billion a year if you're thinking about threatened species or environmental management more broadly. So I just want to remind you that as a nation, last year we've spent $30.2 billion just on cats and dogs, just on pet care. So even just the GST from the money that we spend on pet care would be enough to cover our, uh, the, the conservation of our whole uh, list of threatened species in Australia. Um, so I think that's a really crucial thing to remember. We can afford this. Um, and then, of course, there's, you know, um, <laughs> money for nothing. So there's a whole bunch of reasons, I think, why we shouldn't see this as a resource problem. This is a problem of political will. This is a problem of, um, and political will comes from engagement. It comes from people motivating change in our polity. And so, uh, so let's get engagement right. Some great words already from Judith about business and nature. I just want to touch on a couple of things. There's a task force, force for nature related uh, risk disclosure. This is about uh, where businesses face risks from biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, much in the same way as the same disclosures have to be made where businesses face risk from climate change. Uh, we're seeing that start to develop now as an important motivation for businesses to understand their biodiversity risk. Um, and so uh, similarly, we've actually seen nearly 100 of the world's biggest finance organisations pledge uh, to biodiversity friendly finance. Uh, this is, you know, uh, $14.7 trillion worth of assets, uh, these companies pledging to do biodiversity positive investment. So this is a huge potential opportunity. But coming back to Judith's points, we need to be able to tell them what biodiversity positive is in simple terms. We need to be able to measure it so that they can report on it. There are all these companies who are eager to actually make this good change need to be helped with the really basic tools that we currently don't offer them. So there's this huge need, I think, now for us to sort out um, data, both in terms of, of the um, sort of Western scientific sense of data, but also knowledge and knowing and, and various other ways of providing evidence and measurement to help com companies demonstrate their biodiversity risk and their biodiversity performance. Um, and again, another quote from the, the Auditor General's report, we currently lack performance indicators in reporting to demonstrate the impacts of management interventions on the decline of threatened species. So that comes from the Victorian Auditor General. Um, that signal is very clear. It was also very clear in the Samuel Review data and clear ways of measuring and providing that signal about what's going on in the environment and how we're helping or not helping is absolutely essential in the main gap. And uh, that's all for me.